it's must master is artificial intelligence and all of its associated technologies. Now we believe, uh, we view AI much like Thomas Edison viewed electricity. He said, it is a field of fields. It holds the secrets which will reorganize the life of the world. Now it sounds like a little hyperbole, but we actually believe that. It is a new way of learning which will change everything. It will help us in, uh, utilize quantum computing better. It will help us in health. It will help us in finance. It will help us in military competition. It is truly a field of fields. So with that as background, we said, look, we are not organized to win this competition. We just are not. We say we're in a competition, which is a good thing. The first thing you have to do is admit you have a problem. So Houston, we have a problem, but we have not organized ourselves to win the competition. We do not have a strategy to win the competition. We do not have the resources to implement a strategy, even if we had one. So the first thing is we have got to take this competition seriously and we need to win it. We need to enter it with the one single goal. We will win this technological competition. Um, now what we decided the best way to think about this is we are not organized now. We need to get organized. We said by 2025, we should, the department and the federal government should have the foundations in peace for a widespread uh, integration of AI across the federal government and particularly in DOD. Now there are three main building blocks to achieve this vision. First, you have to have top-down leadership. You cannot say AI is important and then let all of the agencies and subordinate departments figure out what that means. You have to have someone from the top saying, this is the vector, you will follow the vector. If you do not follow the vector, you will be penalized. <clears throat> if you do follow the vector, you will gain extra resources. So you have to have top-down leadership. Now, one of the first recommendations that we made is Jake was underneath the CIO, and it was actually underneath DISA in many ways administratively. And we said, if you want to make AI your central technological thrust. It needs to be elevated, and we recommended that the Jake report either to the secretary or the deputy secretary. That was actually included in the NDAA, and now Jake reports to the deputy secretary of defense. And that's a very good first step. Well, we think the next step is to establish a steering committee on emerging technology. This would be a tri-chaired organization, the deputy secretary, the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the principal deputy director of national intelligence. They would sit and they would look at all of the technologies, they would drive the thrust towards an AI future, and they would coordinate all activities between the intelligence community and DOD, which is a righteous thing. They would be the ones who identify lack of resources, address that problem, uh, and also remove any bureaucratic obstacles. The steering committee would oversee the development of a technology annex of the national defense strategy. The last time we had a list of technologies, there were 10 on the list. All 10 of those were very, very important, but when you have 10 things as your priorities, you have no priorities. You have to establish some type of prioritization and enforce it. So the technology annex to the National Defense Strategy would do just that. Also, the department should set AI readiness performance goals by the end of this fiscal year, 2021, with an eye towards 2025 when we need to be AI ready. So top-down leadership is the first big pillar. The second is to ensure that we have in place the resources, processes, and the organizations to enable AI integration into the force. Now, the uh, commission said you need to establish a common digital ecosystem. The Jake has established the Joint Common Foundation. There are a lot of similarities between the two, although the commission's view is a little bit broader than the Joint uh, Common Foundation at the point. But the point is, 
that everyone sees the necessity uh, that provides access to all users in the department to software trained models, data, computing, and a developmental environment for DevSecOps that is secure. We recommended that you designate the Jake as the AI accelerator. We actually assess that China is a little bit ahead of the United States in fielding applications at scale. We can catch up with them and we believe that Jake is the logical place in the department to really be the accelerator for AI applications at scale. The department has to increase its S&T spending on uh, uh, AI and all of R&D. We think it should be a minimum of 3.4 percent of the budget and we recommend that the department spend about eight billion dollars on AI R&D annually. That will allow us, we think, to cover down on all the key research areas. There's all sorts of specialized acquisition pathways and contracting authorities out there. We still continually need to refine them because many of them are not perfectly applicable to software type things. And I know Jake is working on this, uh, but we have to have an updated approach to the budget and oversight process for these things. So the second big pillar is ensure you have the resources and the processes and the organizations. And third, you have to accelerate and scale tech adoption. You really have to push this. So we recommend standing up an AI development team at every single COCOM with four deployable elements, and they leverage technological uh, knowledge to develop innovative operational concepts and essentially establish a pull for AI-enabled applications that will help them uh, accomplish their missions. The department should prioritize adoption of commercial AI solutions, especially for all of the back office stuff. There's really no reason to do a lot of research on those type applications. The commercial industry has plenty of them. You just have to prioritize identifying the ones that can be modified for our use and bring them in as quickly as possible. We think the department should establish a dedicated AI fund under the control of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And that fund would allow the uh, Undersecretary to get small, innovative AI companies across the valley of death. And this would be up to the Undersecretary of Defense for R&E, who is the Chief Technology Officer of the department. Now, the things that undercross all of these are talent, uh, ethics and international partnerships. Let me talk about talent first. We think you ha we have to have a DOD digital core modeled after the medical core. These are digitally savvy warriors, administrators, and leaders. We just need to know who they are. We need to code them in some way, and we need to make sure they're in the places that have the highest return on investment. We need to train and educate warfighters to develop core competencies in using and responsibly teaming with machine systems, understanding their limitations, understanding what they should not be asked to do, et cetera. And equally, AI and other emerging technologies need to feature prominently in senior leader education and training with a key focus on ethics, the ethical use of AI. Now go right into that. We're in a competition with authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes will use technology that reflect their own governing principles. We already know how China wants to use AI. They want to use it for population surveillance. They want to use it to suppress minorities. They want to use it to cut individual privacy and trample on civil liberties. That's not going to work for a democratic nation like the United States. And so this is as much a values competition as it is a technological competition. The way Eric Schmidt, our chairman, talks about this is we're going to employ platforms which bring these technologies. So let's just think about how 5G worked. Huawei's 5G technologies allowed a country who do this uh, or uses it to essentially surveil their population. So these values are very, very critical and an important part of the competition. 
And finally, we're not going to succeed if we do it alone. This is a kind of central thinking and U.S. defense um, strategies. So we have to promote AI interoperability in the adoption of emerging technologies across among our allies and our partners. We are absolutely confident as a commission we can win this competition, but we will not win it if we do not organize ourselves and have a strategy and have resources for the strategy and a means by which to implement the strategy and make sure that everyone is doing their part. Thank you. Good. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for participating in this important session. And uh, first, I want to say thank you to uh, Secretary Work and the National Security Commission AI on AI uh, team. Uh, just incredible work. I mean, what you see, if, you, if you've read the report, I, if you haven't, I encourage you to go to the website and look at the NSC AI final report. Um, what you see is like a deep understanding and a deep analysis of down to first principles, bare metal for what it takes for AI integration and preserving our military effectiveness. Um, what they produce is critically important, and critically important for us in the department, but it's also critically important for our national competitiveness. In the same breath, um, I, I'd like to say thank you to Congress and, uh, and department leadership, both of which clearly understand the importance and the need to innovate and modernize uh, the way we fight and the way we do business. And I'm happy to report, as the director of the JIG, a positive momentum toward implementation of an AI, uh, of implementation of AI at scale. We certainly have a long ways to go, but you can see the needle trending positive. Uh, we, with bipartisan support from Congress, with great support from the DOD leadership, the services are beginning to develop AI initiatives and expand operational experimentation, that is, taking those first steps. The defense agencies are reaching out daily to share their best practices with us and with each other. The combatant commands, especially the combatant commanders, have, uh, have caught a glimpse of what the future might look like through a series of, of integrative exercises. They like it and they are, they're eager to gain these capabilities. Uh, with the Jake now aligned under the Deputy Secretary, uh, which gives her and the rest of the department leadership access to the tools and processes to reinforce their priorities, underline our ethical foundations, integrate our enterprises, and transform our business processes. And we, we, we are eagerly looking forward to that work. <clears throat> like the NSC AI, we see AI, AI as a core tenet of defense modernization. And when I say AI, I want to be clear, I'm not just talking about the Jake. All AI, the, the, the efforts of the services, the efforts of the departments uh, and the agencies rides on the foundations of good networks, good data services, good security, and good partnerships. And a, an important part of the Jake's business model is to build those as part of our AI infrastructure. And with lots of budget work ahead, I think, you know, we'll hear, uh, you know, as FY22 is relooked and, and the Palm 23 to 27 is developed, you know, we'll hear a lot about modern weapons systems and concepts. And it's important that we, should, we understand that their potential, those weapon systems, those concepts, their potential to modernize our war fighting rides on, those on the foundational data, the networks, the algorithms that we build to integrate and inform them. Uh, we'll have to talk about these technical foundation and architectures in the same conversation that we talk about platforms. Getting AI right and our secure data fabric environment right will be central to our ability to compete effectively with the Chinese and the Russians as well, or any modern threat for that matter. Um, and, and there's more, actually. So in an era of tightening budgets and, and, a, and, a, and a, a focus on, on, uh, on squeezing out uh, things that are, that are legacy and not important in the budget, um, uh, the productivity gains and the efficiency gains that AI can bring to the department, especially through the, the business process transformation, actually becomes an economic necessity. So in a squeeze play between modernizing our war, uh, warfare that moves at machine speed and tighter budgets, AI is doubly, ne doubly necessary. Uh, so what, I'm, what am I talking about when I talk about AI? As uh, Secretary Work's comments uh, convey, the integration of AI across the, across the government and the Department of Defense is much more than just a, just a, uh, you know, a, a facile layer of technology applied. It's not about shiny objects. You've heard the, you know, the, the phrase amateur study tactics and professional study logistics. 
Well, in this environment, amateurs talk about applications and professionals talk about architectures and networks and elevating the AI dialogue in the department so that we are talking about the foundations of all of our modern capabilities is a really important task, one that we're, that we're, we're working hard on. Uh, the core business model, that is what the department uh, you know, gives to the American people, what our mission is doesn't change. But a modernized, data-driven, software-heavy organization will, will do things in a different way. It's a, it really represents a transformation of our operating model. How do we do the things that we do as a Department of Defense? And that operating model will have to create a common data environment where data is shared, data is authoritative, data is available. The data feeds and algorithms across the department will create productivity gains, accelerate processes, uh, uh, provide management visibility, insights into markets. And if all of that sounds like a modern software-driven company, uh, you know, you can think, think of all of our tech giants uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and smaller innovative companies across the, the U.S. economy. Um, it's because it is. It's the same challenge. It's the same problem. And so we have examples, right? There's very little magic here. It's about making our organization, the Department of Defense in this case, as productive and efficient as any of these modern successful data-driven enterprises. But there's so much more because all of this technology applies equally to our warfighting capabilities. Our capabilities in a broad range of supporting activities from all the defense agencies and other places that make up the business of the department. We've created positive momentum for AI and we continue to build on that now. But now comes the real critical test. Um, in, as in any transformation, uh, the, the hardest part is institutional change and change management of the workforce and practices and processes that drive, that drive a business. This step will not be easy, even within the Department of Defense, but it's foundational to our competitive success, our accountability, and our affordability. As the NSCAI work reveals, I mean, we, we have a generational opportunity here for AI to be our future we must act now. We need to start the, putting these places into place now. Um, so I want to quickly describe our position through two different lenses. One is competition and the other is opportunity. Uh, first of all, with, with respect to AI competition, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's illustrative to talk about the economic impacts of artificial intelligence as a first order. Um, economic forecasts predict a, an AI uh, economy of 16 trillion, a 16 trillion dollar AI economy in the next 10 years, and and this, this will this will this could amount to massive. Uh, GDP increases, 26%, as high as 26% for China, as high as 15% for the United States, that to, 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 to participate in this competitive AI marketplace. And if we do that, uh, uh, this, is core, this core economic competitiveness of the United States then needs to be reflected in a core military uh, competitiveness in this, in this space as well. It's important to note that you know, while we talk about a $16 trillion market in the next decade, um, it, this happens to coincide pretty closely with China's declared and often repeated uh, intent to be globally dominant in AI by 2030. So we look at the transformation of our economy has to be accompanied with a, a, a close attention to the emerging threats that are taken, that are that are declaring their intention to use this as a point of competition between uh, autocracies and democracies. Our forces must operate with tempo, with data-driven decisions, with human-machine teaming. Uh, our forces must have broad situational awareness, multi-domain integration. Uh, uh, the, the, the PRC has a robust entrepreneurial AI environment. I mean, we're all familiar with you know, Ant Financial or Alibaba, Tencent. I mean, these are global companies. Um, but we're also very familiar with the artifacts of p population surveillance, minority oppression, the, the things that the Secretary of Work talked about under the Chinese Commun Communist Party's rule. We, we read about Beijing's large-scale camp campuses, or their tech campuses and their, their state-owned enterprises that create a pipeline from entrepreneurs and innovators in China to, through the civil-military fusion, the, take those capabilities directly into the PLA and military capabilities without intervening accountability or transparency. Um, their organizational efficiency, that, that uh, autocratic rule, they count that as an advantage 
is, is being applied directly to their AI development, and they are surging forward in their, in their, in their capability. This has to give us pause to contemplate. What does, what does China's dominance in AI mean for us if they intend that dominance uh, by 2030? What does that imply for us? But we also can look through the lens of opportunity. Our best opportunities lie in American innovation. Academia and small companies are brimming with good ideas in the AI space. The, the number of AI companies is pr proliferating rapidly. rapidly. Um, we have war fighters across the department, especially young ones, that can visualize their use cases in their operating environment and the things that they need, need to do from a military capability perspective. They're good at this. They know how to operate in a data-driven and app-based environment because they grew up that way. And they expect the same from their defense systems. We have the best science and the best AI research available uh, uh, in, in academia inside the United States and in small companies. And we also benefit from the fact that we have a tech inversion in place where the, the AI technology that we need to run our department and change our operating model exists right, literally right across the street. And many of the companies, the, the modern AI-driven, data-driven companies that have survived in a very competitive market, we have lots of good examples to look at. We also have a rock-solid ethical baseline that drives a principled approach, that drives our test and evaluation, our verification, our validation, our policy, and in the end of the, in, in the, end of the, of the analysis, in our trust in our AI systems. And I welcome your questions about that. The good news, we have a thousand flowers blooming inside the department through the initiative of the services, the agencies, and the activities of the department. And we're doing better to, to integrate uh, our industry technical expertise with warfighting functional expertise so that we can actually responsibly and responsibly build, implement technology in the places that matter most. Uh, we have the opportunity to drive productivity, efficiency, effectiveness uh, to, of the department to new heights. And uh, the performers across the department, in the Jake, in the services and other places, are very excited and count themselves lucky to be part of, uh, of this work. And uh, uh, with that, we very much look forward to your questions and uh, appreciate your attention. All right, everybody, uh, we've got about 16 or 17 reporters on the line, so if we could dash just one question at a time, and then I promise I will get to you uh, for a second if we have time. So the first question is going to go out to uh, Mr. Aaron Gregg from the Washington Post. Aaron, I know you're on the line. I believe you're on the line. Go ahead. Thank you guys for doing this. Um, how does the enterprise cloud strategy play into all of this? Um, is this hodgepodge that you're currently working with uh, working for the department? And uh, what does the strategy look like under this new administration and the new SecDef? So, so I'll, 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 I'll take that one first. Um, so, so what we have today, you're right, we have development environments and pretty mature development by environments uh, in each of the services. Some of the services have multiple development environments. And, and so one of the things that we, that we have to look at is, um, you know, where, what degree of resilience do we gain from having multiple dev environments, but also what advantages do we gain by, by stitching those development environment, environments together into a, into a fabric? So that is our intent, and that is what we're looking for now, mapping that out. So what, you know, what we need is, is a network of development environments that shares, uh, you know, through a containerized process, shares, uh, you know, authority to operate on networks, that shares access to data sources, that shares algorithms, and that shares de even developmental tools and developmental environments. And so this is what we're trying to construct today so that we can broaden the base of developmental work. But on top of that, we need an operating layer, an operating network. And, and this is kind of the next step, because if you take those developmental algorithms and you're going to employ them in a, in a, in a, in a steady state basis, in a combatant command, in a warfighting situation, wherever, then you need an, a network of operating platforms that you can do the same thing. And so this is the next step as we evolve developmental platforms into a fabric. We move that up to the operational level and integrate uh, uh, service networks in, into, a, in, into, a, into a, a, a global network. This will give us the capability to have global situational awareness and then to achieve the goals of what's described in JADC2, which is you know, any sensor, any shooter, or any sensor and any decision maker, uh, we're going to build that network, the, da the data stores and the processes that make that possible. And we're going to do that as a team across the department. But the Jake hopes to uh, help coordinate the, uh, the alliance that brings that together. 
I can't add to that. Okay, we'll go to the next question, sir. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Louis Martinez with ABC News. Um, just a question for both of you, please. Um, General, um, Secretary Work talked about how China is way ahead on this. Um, in terms of what you just spoke about, uh, <coughs> worldwide awareness, China right now is really still more of a regional part player trying to become a worldwide uh, player. Um, does AI make that leap for them? Or is the AI advantage that they have still strictly only regional? And Mr. Work, if I could ask you about, uh, I think the final report talked about the importance of the human element in AI. Can you talk about that, especially as some people may have concerns about, since we're here at the Pentagon, talking about how AI relates to the weaponization of that technology? So, so th thank you, Luis, for the, for, for the question. The, the, uh, I, th I think it's important to kind of pay attention to what China and their relationship with AI and the technology is. You know, for example, the Chinese export autonomous systems to nations around the world in, you know, in some places that, that have some pretty, some pretty ugly conflicts that are underway um, and, you know, lots of human suffering. And uh, uh, not a lot of world attention in some cases. But, but so here you are, you have a nation that's proliferating autonomous systems with no ethical baseline, no sets of controls, no transparency into those very dangerous, small, uh, you know, brush fire wars that are going on in, in a lot of different places. So that proliferation of technology is something that we need to pay attention to. Similarly, as you look at, uh, you know, for example, just, you know, right now, Chinese ships underway, you, you know, uh, you know, moving, moving east, you know, to, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a demonstration capability shows you their willingness to push the boundaries, uh, you know, and to be considered something more than a regional power. So that ambition drives, I think, is linked to their technological ambition of AI dominance. And so we have to look at if these are if these things are coupled today what does that hold for the future uh, you know in 25 2025 or 2030 we have to be prepared for that and we have to be as agile and as competitive in this space as the chinese uh, intend to be this is a great question i would like to uh, um, clarify if something i said we do not believe china is ahead right now in ai the way we went about it as a commission is we said, look, AI is not a single technology. It is a bundle of technologies. And we referred to it as the AI stack. And the AI stack has talent, the people that are going to use this, has data, has the hardware that actually runs the algorithms, uh, algorithms, applications, and integration. And so what we tried to do is we looked at each of the six and said, where does the U.S. have an advantage and where does China have an advantage? We believe the U.S. has an advantage in talent right now. We definitely are the global kind of magnet for best talent. There's a lot of things changing in that. And unless we're smart about our immigration policies, et cetera, we could lose that. But right now we judge that we have better talent. Second, we know we have an advantage in hardware the United States and the West most more broadly. And we think we have an advantage in our algorithms. Although the Chinese are really pushing hard, we think that they could catch up with us within five to 10 years. Now, they have an advantage in our view uh, in data. They have a lot of data and they don't have the restrictions on privacy, et cetera, that we do. They have an advantage in applications they're very good at that. And we think they have an, uh, an advantage in integration because they have a coherent strategy to get all of the AI stack together to give them a national advantage. Now, we judge because talent, hardware, and algorithms are so central and important to the stack. We judge that the United States actually is ahead of China in AI technologies more broadly. But what we're saying is the Chinese are far more organized for a competition and have a strategy to win the competition and are putting in a lot of resources. So as uh, Lieutenant General Groen said, they want to be the world leader in AI technology by 2030. As soon as they say that, that means to me they recognize that they are not the world AI leader now. 
and it's going to take them about 10 years, they think, eight years or so, uh, to surpass the United States. That's why we say, look, we better be in this competition full on by 2025. If we don't, then we run the risk of them surpassing us. So I just wanted to clarify that. I wasn't saying that China is ahead of us in AI. Uh, the second thing, uh, part of your question is, all you got to do is look at what they did with Huawei to say the way they think about becoming a global power is not by invading countries. It is putting out AI platform, excuse me, technology platforms that allow their values to proliferate around the world. And that's what happened with Huawei. Um, and the other place they're going really hog wild on are global standard setting, which is kind of the U.S. That's in our wheelhouse. We've been doing that since the end of World War II. And the Chinese are actually coordinating with the Russians to set global standards in AI that prefer their type of technology. So without question, I agree with, uh, with Lieutenant General Groen. The Chinese have ambitions to be a global power. They say by 2050, actually it's 2049, it's the 100 year anniversary. They want to be, have the largest economy in the world, and they want to be the foremost military power in the world. Um, that's not a future that the United States should say, yeah, let's just let that happen. Let's compete because we want to be the world's foremost uh, military power and we want to be the most dynamic, innovative economy in the world. So the Chinese definitely have global ambitions. They are a regional power now, but they're really starting to move more broadly on the world stage. Okay, next question goes to Sydney Freeberg from Breaking Defense. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for doing us. Sydney Freeberg, Breaking Defense here. Uh, let me let me ask a question, particularly for General Groan. Uh, of the various recommendations in the AI Commission final report, which ones uh, is DOD uh, contemplating? Which ones are actually you know concurred with that you guys are going to try to put forward? Uh, by the, by yourselves or by asking Congress for legislation, and which ones do you guys actually not concur with? Uh, the things you know, the the their conditions like uh, the steering committee, like uh, setting the various targets, uh, like you know, coming up with a strategy annex and so forth. Uh, can you go through the checklist of things the commission wants to, to do that uh, you guys are you know green light, yellow light, or red light on proceeding with? Yeah, yeah, great question, Sydney. Good morning. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so really, really good question. Now, the NSCAI report, if you look at it in its full breadth, um, addresses uh, a lot of the recommendations are at the national level, a place where defense may play a part, but defense might not lead. Uh, there are there is a subset of recommendations uh, on the order of 40 that 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 we that we've taken a hard look at that uh, that are military specific and that that really by all rights defense would lead. So as we look at that list or I'm sorry it's closer to 100 recommendations as we look at that list um, a, a good number of them, about about half, maybe a little bit more, we're already moving out on to a significant degree. So in those cases, it's really just a matter for us of taking a look at the NSCAI rec uh, recommendations in detail to make sure that we've considered the full scope of what might appear in one of those recommendations, and, and then see if what we're doing today aligns with those. So that's 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 uh, you know kind of one large subset, which is which is the the majority. Then there's another set of recommendations that uh, you know that we've looked at, but we really don't have a plan for yet. You know, we recognize that it's a problem, but we're not quite ready to move out in that direction just because of limited bandwidth here. So that's that's another subset that that we're looking at. And then there's a third subset that you know those that we really have to look hard at. There are things that we hadn't thought about before, and we really need to kind of pull the strings on the implications of those. So there's that third subset. When you when you talk about which ones we agree with or don't agree with, I, 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 I can't think of any that we don't agree with. The things that are most pressing, that most closely align with what we're doing today, are these idea the, the ideas associated with starting to create a, a, an enterprise of capabilities. Um, all of the recommendations about the ethical foundations, we are all about 
you know, fleshing out our ethical foundations and really, really integrating that into every aspect of our process. The recommendations about uh, organizing, uh, you know, with with defense priorities, um, you know, that will be the subject of the department. So we, as an AI community, can advocate. But that's the department process that'll decide what the priorities are, and so and we'll we'll adhere to whatever those priorities are articulated. The uh, the recommendation about workforce development and this, the the family of recommendations about workforce development, we could not agree more. So how do we how do we go? You know, have a full range of train a training environment or an education environment that includes, you know, just like short, short duration tactical training, for example, for, you know, a coder to get on a platform all the way to, you know, building service academies or building, you know, ROTC scholarships and that sort of thing. So, so, you know, across the department, as some of these recommendations, you know, with large scale and large scope, it, it starts to, uh, you know, supersede what just the AI community in the department does, too. So we work clear, closely with the research and engineering department. We work closely with the, uh, the, you know, the personnel and readiness and the acquisition sustainment to start to form the coalitions to, to get after the problems that, 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 uh, that, that are underneath those recommendations to make sure that we understand them and that we are actually moving toward this, this new, uh, you know, operational model for how we are going to operate as a department. Thank you, Sydney. Sydney, I guess the way I would answer this, I can't really add too much more to what Lieutenant General Groen said, is you know, just a little while ago, Secretary of Defense Mark Esper said, AI is the number one priority for me as a Secretary of Defense. And he went on to say, the competitor that really wins in the AI competition will have a battlefield advantage for decades. Now, if you believe that, and I certainly do, and I believe the commission, I think that's a unanimous consensus. If you really believe that, you can't keep doing what we're doing now. I mean, the Defense Science Board said in 2014, the one thing you got to get right is AI and AI-enabled autonomy. So here we are seven years later, and we're saying, okay, if we really believe that AI is going to give a competitor an advantage for a decade, are we satisfied with the progress that has happened since 2014? And if the answer is no, then you have to say, then we got to change things up. And of course, people are going to say, hey, why would you make the uh, Undersecretary of Defense for R&E the co-chair and the chief science officer of the JROC. The JROC works perfect. Well, does every single program have a plug in it for AI and being able to receive data for machine learning chips? Does it have the ports to allow them to pass on information? If the answer is no, we're not doing good enough. I think uh, Lieutenant General, excuse me, General Hyten, the vice chair, uh, vice chairman, has said this very clearly. He's not satisfied with the way the JROC is functioning, and he wants to change it so it really pushes these more broader joint system of system things that uh, Luke, uh, Lieutenant General Groen was talking about. So from the commissioner's point of view, look, uh, right now we do not believe we are moving as fast as we should, and if the department agrees with that general assessment, then they need to change things. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Christina Anderson, AWPS News. Um, I wonder if you could speak to getting the data, the security, the secure data fabric right, and then taking that up a notch to kind of the global uh, structure of AI. How, how can you think about uh, building this structure so that security is one of the fundamental elements of that. Yeah. That's one of the criticisms of the internet right now is that when it was built, notwithstanding the tremendous benefits that we have, that it has, was not built with security in mind. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Christina. That's a, that's an excellent question, and to me, that's the operative question because I, I I think you know there's a, there's a there's a a good alignment as we talk about you know op the operational effects that we want to achieve. There's good alignment when we talk about building platforms and how we you know how we're going to integrate data and share data. 
the, the, the very first question we start to ask at that point is, okay, how are we going to secure this? How do we secure this environment? And so we, we have a full court press on, so of course we have, you know, native cloud security, you know, additional security that, 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 that we, we've been able to add. You know, you know we've got lots of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, cyber security specialists look, helping us look at this problem set. But more importantly, uh, we're trying to keep an eye on the entire research and development ecosystem. So not just from a cybersecurity perspective, but how do we deal with adversarial AI, for example? How do we deal with you know, purposeful intent to intervene or to interfere with our algorithms or spoof our algorithms? So this is a very, this is probably, I would say this is certainly the top priority and probably our largest effort right now from a research and development perspective is how, how do we make sure that as we build this out, we squeeze out all the vulnerabilities that we can. We will never have a perfect system, we will never have a perfect internet, but we need to protect it like we would protect any weapon system or any other critical node. Thank That's you. a central question, uh, Christina. Um, as uh, Lieutenant General Groen said, we're moving into an era of AI competition, and poisoning data is a way to gain an advantage we have to be able to guard against that. We need to red team the heck out of our databases. We need to have people trying to break into the database uh, and poison data often so that we can identify vulnerabilities and fix them. Uh, we have to have means by which to check the data. Uh, and there's all sorts of different things that uh, the commercial, uh, uh, you know, the commercial sector is doing this also. Uh, they're uh, looking, how do you protect the data? And how do you protect your algorithms um, to make sure that no biases are in inserted? So, um, look, we don't have the answers, uh, for, you know, all the answers for this yet, but it's central to the thinking of the Jake, I think you heard, and uh, our AI has to be better than their AI. Uh, all you have to do is envision an AI enable cyber attack, and if their AI is better on offense than our AI is better on defense, that's going to be a bad day for us. So, um, you know, constant red teaming, constant development with DevSecOps in mind, constant testing and evaluation, validation and verification. Uh, this is our future now. Uh, it's going to be something we just have to take as a matter of course. Next question goes out to Tony from Bloomberg News. Go ahead, Tony. Hi, this is Tony Capasio. I, I have a question, an operational application question that I think most of the citizens can relate to. Next month marks the 10th anniversary of the bin Laden raid by SEAL Team 6. Conceptually, if AI was, was in widespread use in 2011, how might it have been employed in planning and executing the raid? I'm thinking facial recognition, pinpointing the movements of activity in and around the compound, calculating the height of the walls and their thickness, et cetera. Can you think outside the box and give us a couple examples of how it might have been used in that raid? Yeah, so, hey, so great, great question, Tony. And, and I, think, I think that raised, I mean, so when I look at, when I look at that, remember when I said, um, you know, amateur study apps, professional study architectures, I think, I think we... If we take any military operation, I can't really speak to you know to that particular event, but but any military operation, it's easy to get fixated on the on the applications that that exist on the tactical edge. But when you when you walk back a military problem, I mean you start with those you know you start with those tactical warnings you know on the objective or near the objective, and you back up a step and you need to be broadly situational aware, and you back up another step and you need to be aware of not just the red capabilities and the red force, but you also need to know where the blue force is and where your own forces are and their readiness and their, ready and their avail availability. You also need to understand the green forces, you know, those partner forces that we might have in the area, or the white forces, you know, the, civilian, the innocent civilian populations who might be in the area. Like, so all of those kind of situational awareness activities can be worked through AI, right? That can be done much better than a human being can do it by, by leveraging AI to work on all that data. And you start backing up even further. And you talk about, well, how do you have uh, 
uh, affects integration. Like when you know when do you when do you get onto the objective, and how do you coordinate with a, an adjacent unit? How do you make sure that your um, you know that your fires are safe and and uh, and are focused on on, uh, on on the good targets. Again, AI can help with the information flow that informs that decision making. Back up further, uh, you know, weather effects. Do we have global weather that's in a database that everybody can use and integrate into their application? Do we have threat picture that's integrated into our applications and defense? Do we know threat me behavior? Have we modeled that? Do we use it for understanding the human populations, uh, predictive modeling, and you know the list goes on and on. And you know the further you go back into the, into the institution, you're talking about modeling and simulation, you know, platform maintenance, you know preventive maintenance for helicopter platforms, for example, uh, integrated logistics, contingency management. Um, uh, you know, fleet maintenance. You know, think think of of, of like an electronic or electric car company that that broadcasts updates to their entire fleet of vehicles. This is the sort of capabilities that AI brings to the department. And when you start stacking those up, you really see how it focuses. You know, it, you focus that lens on a on a tactical military problem. It's not just the AI at the tactical edge, but it's all of the AI that has cr contributed all the way to the back office of the Pentagon where we're doing financial records, right? Or inventory management, or all of the sort of the business of, the de of defense focus through data into that objective. So I hope, I hope that helps. For, you know what, I'll just give you one other point. I mean, for, every, for almost every military activity, there's a commercial analog to that activity. I mean, you think about the, you know, a, a large scale uh, uh, shopping, online shopping network that has to deal with ordering and buying and recommending and, and presenting options and selecting options and delivering. You know, for, for every one of those has a parallel in the military space. The AI that we integrate from commercial industry today, that technology that's readily available, helps us do those same things with the efficiency and productivity that, that any large-scale, successful commercial corporation does today. And, and from a business perspective, that's exactly what we need to have. Thanks. It's a clever question, Tony. And uh, to me, the biggest change would be our ability to look at enormous amounts of social media data, et cetera, uh, to make predictive analysis and also make judgments. I'm a movie aficionado, so everything I know about the Bin Laden raid I learned in Zero Dark Thirty. And if Zero Dark Thirty is correct, what uh, DCIA, the director of CIA Panetta, was constantly asking is, how sure are we that he's in the compound? You know, before we execute a raid in another sovereign country, how sure are we? Well, I just go to the shoot down of the uh, Ukrainian airliner, and uh, we knew the Russians did it immediately through national technical means and other, other stuff. But we didn't want to release that because of sources and methods. There was a company called Bellincat who essentially put together the storyboard for the entire shootdown using social media. You know, they had a picture of a tell uh, with three surface-to-air missiles on it, a picture of it crossing the border uh, into uh, eastern Ukraine with the serial number on the side. They had another picture of a missile contrail right next to the uh, village where the shootdown occurred. They had another picture of the same tell with the same serial number going back into Russia with two instead of three missiles. They put together a storyboard just using social media. It was 100 percent, you know, any objective person would say, whoa, the Russians really did shoot down that airliner. And had we had the capability we have now to go through all sorts of data, uh, then I think the analysts would have been able to tell Director Panetta, we are 100 percent certain that bin Laden is in that compound. And here's all of the data that we can show you. And then predictive analysis, like uh, Lieutenant General Groen said. The president might have asked, what do we expect to be the reaction of uh, the Muslim community if it becomes aware that we execute a raid and we kill bin Laden? Uh, 
AI is able to do that type of predictive uh, INW. We're doing it right now uh, in Afghanistan, uh, using AI to predict when the attacks might occur or predict um, you know, actions uh, by our adversaries. Um, I don't think AI would have made that much difference in the raid force itself unless they had specific applications that they needed uh, to uh, say what is the most up-to-date intelligence, you know, what is happening, do we need to change our plan, etc. But uh, to me, we already have kind of an answer for you. Uh, AI is, <laughs> gives you a tool uh, that we've never, ever really had. One of our commissioners, Ken Ford, uh, refers to this as AI gives commanders eyeglasses for the mind. And I thought it was such a pithy observation. It helps look through enormous amounts of data that a human would be incapable of interpreting. And the AI is able to find patterns, make inferences, etc. So that's what we mean by human-machine collaboration. You let the machine do all that hard number crunching and stuff like that, and you leave the commander, the human commander, to exercise their creative spirit and their initiative and their understanding of the broader strategic concept. Human-machine collaboration uh, is a big, big deal in the future of AI. Next question goes out to Jasmine from National Defense. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, my question has to do with comments that um, the chairman of the commission has made before, uh, Eric Schmidt. He said um, that China is maybe two years behind the United States. Um, Lieutenant General Groen, I was wondering if you agree with that assessment or do you think that it's a bit, we have a bit more of an advantage? Yeah, th thanks, Jasmine. I, I, uh, I, I think I would echo what, uh, what the Secretary Work articulated before. Y you know, Trying to measure advantage in a space like this is a very, you know, is a very difficult undertaking. Or uh, undertaking, I, I think, uh, you know, you can look at places where there is there is clear superiority on the U.S. side. I think, like our academic environment. I mean, uh, uh, the United States academic community is is unsurpassed globally. Uh, you look at our small innovative companies and the things that they're working. Uh, you know, the, every, almost every company these days is an AI company, and a lot of them have really good vertical sto stovepipe capabilities. So there's great innovation that goes all across the United States. Um, you look at on the on the Chinese side. I mean, you do have the organizational efficiency of autocracy. And you have all of the, uh, you know, the moral impacts of that as well. But, uh, you know, I, I think the competition, and if you really wanted to simplify it, might, you know, might be, as in a sense, um, the, the uh, organizational efficiency versus innovation and innovation efficiency. And so when you look at that competition from that, from, from the, through those two lenses, you really have to pay attention to both, right? It's like, how do we achieve organizational efficiency in our efforts so that we can compete, can compete keep pace with a, with a bigger machine, but then also how can we continue to innovate so that we're not stuck in yesterday's technology and we continue to push the envelope. So it's a really hard thing to measure. I think both countries have, uh, you know, have demonstrated significant global capabilities, and so we have to be in this fight for sure. Yeah, I mean, I agree. This is really a tough thing to kind of judge. Uh, the way we did it, as I explained earlier, is we broke down the AI stack into its six components. We judge that we're ahead, slightly ahead, or ahead in three of the six, and China is ahead or slightly ahead in three of the six. So it's a really, really tight competition. We admitted that the Chinese could probably catch up with us in algorithms within five to ten years. We also say that we're 100 miles away from, becoming, from being two generations ahead in hardware to being two generations in behind. If, for example, China sees Taiwan and the fabricating, the chip fabricating facilities that are on Taiwan. So Eric Schmidt has been working in this area for a long time. And his judgment is, look, I think we're about two years ahead. But he will tell anyone who listens, the Chinese are coming on fast. Uh, you know, they're ahead in some, we're ahead in some. 
Uh, we need to take this, take this competition like a politician takes a political race. You have to run like you're losing. Um, and so it's important that we really gear up and go. Okay, we have time for one more question. That'll go out to Jackson from FedScoop. Go ahead, Jackson. Thank you so much. Um, I hope I have my dates right here, but with General Groen, I believe we're six months out from your announcement of Jake 2.0 and shifting to be more of an enabling force, hoping you can give us just an update on how that change is going. Um, and if I could ask specifically about, you know, are you now sending out um, officials to kind of be liaisons to specific AI offices across the force? How is that going? Is there any you know, tension with, with Jake officials maybe showing up and, and offering help. How, how is that successful? Maybe how are things, uh, are there any things you might change in, in the future? And then if I could also ask Mr. Work, um, previously you've said that the Jake should take a, a naval nuclear reactor rickover type strategy to be in kind of an AI coordination office. Uh, do you think that holds any tension between the kind of thousand flowers blooming approach that's being taken? What is your current stance on, on that? Thank you. So, so I'll, I'll start with, uh, thanks Jackson, a great, great question. And uh, so, so as we, you I think accurately described what we want to do in Jake 2.0. So we realized kind of our, our initial business model uh, wasn't getting us where we needed to go. It was not transformational enough. And so we really started focusing on broad enablement. And I think we've been fairly successful in that space. We do have uh, a, a great outreach organizations. We do pay keen attention to all of the service development Developments, and we try to partner with all of them. Uh, we pay keen attention to the demand signals from the combatant commands, and we want to we want to work with anybody who is doing AI today. But here's how we approach that problem set, right? Like our first duty, I think, or one of the things that we do well um, is measure our success and the success of others. And the second thing that I think we do well is we don't go to these organizations or partner the, with these organizations from a position of teacher student. We come in as, as archivists of best practice across the department and, and say, hey, show us how you're doing that. Let us learn from you. And then we can share, hey, you know, there's another agency in the department that has a, a problem very similar to yours. And here's how they're addressing that. So we play broker for information and expertise across, you know, across agencies, across uh, uh, services, across combatant commands. And then what we can do is then turn that into, because of our uh, co you know, congressional, congressional authority now to do our own acquisition, for example, now we can actually start providing a much broader array of, of support service and services and enabling services that help make all of those customers successful. We think we're a force for good here. We 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 approach the challenge with humility, and we are uh, we measure our success and the success of others. And so that has gotten us a long way. I will say this: um, as I look at the challenge that Secretary Work has laid out so effectively, um, even now I wonder: is that an, is Jake 2.0 enough? Right? Are we moving fast enough? Are we moving fast enough to create? enterprises of capability and overcome stovepipe developments? Are we moving fast enough to really change our operating model to data-driven uh, and data visibility across the department? Are we moving fast enough in integrating uh, innovative technology into the department? And uh, sometimes I lay awake, lay awake at night and say the answer is no. And uh, uh, that challenge and feeling the you know, hot breath on the back of our necks is what keeps the Jake motivated and keeps us working hard every day because we recognize how how big this is and the scale of the Department of Defense and how necessary this transformation is at scale. Thanks for the question. That was great. Jackson, you know, every now and then somebody asks me a question like yours and I go, God, did I really say that? Uh, <laughs> but uh, at the time, what I was saying is, do we really believe that we're going to build the department around the capabilities of AI and AI enabled autonomy? And nuclear reactors made the you're going to build a submarine around the reactor, and you're going to have to have the people who understand everything about how that reactor works and how it interfaces with all the other systems on the submarines. We're going to make sure that we pick the people uh, who are in charge. Uh, we're going to set the standards. No one, no one can touch the standards except for us. And so at the time, I was saying, you know, there's a lot of uh, advantages of this. 
But over the last two years, working with 14 other brilliant commissioners, the recommendations that we put into the commission, I'm fully behind. Uh, and I personally think that if you use, well, I'll just lay my cards on the table. We thought about this as a blueprint, and we said, look, you really shouldn't look at all of our recommendations and say, hmm, I kind of like that one. I'll pull that off the wall. You have to do them all together to get the effect that the commission feels is important. So right now, I would say I've changed from the nuclear reactor model to the National Commission on Artificial <laughs> Intelligence model. And I would just like to say thank again for all of the people who listened in. Uh, the report is voluminous. You know, it's over 760 pages. But our staff, which is like a world-class staff, uh, did everything they could for it to be interactive, for you to be able to go into that final report and find the information that you would like. There are so many recommendations. This is why I have so much paper. I mean, I can't keep track of all of the recommendations in the report. I need to be reminded of them. But I would ask all of you to read the report because we feel it is so important for our economic competitiveness and our military competitiveness. I want to thank you for hosting us today yes, sir. and allowing us to uh, uh, kind of pitch our product. Thank you for the 760 page to-do list, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we're out of time, but for those of you that we didn't get to with questions, uh, please submit your questions to OSD Public Affairs and we can answer those. So thanks everyone on the lines and everybody here today for attending and thank you very much.